Okay, yes, it has started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our webinar today. My name is Pearl. Hello, I'm Evan. And we also have Larry Pond, CPA, and he's also a board member of the Better Business Bureau for over 25 years. So thank you for joining us today, Larry. Thank you. And we're gonna get started. So this is actually part two of a series that we've done with Larry. And the first one was how the new tax law will affect your business. And this one will focus more on individuals. So Larry, take it on from here. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> so we've gone through the biggest uh, tax law change in 30 years. So the last time we had tax reform was 1986. And uh, this year we've gone through some major tax changes. So I wanna point out some of the things that affect that may affect you personally. So definitely take a look at the earlier podcast that we did, and that's specifically on small business. Um, I'm gonna go over the agenda next, and then um, at, at the end of this, um, at, at the end, we'll, we'll answer your questions. So there's a, a box on your screen there where you can type in questions, and we'll take a look at those and answer as many as we can before we run out of time. So for today, we're gonna talk about some of the big changes that happened, the new tax rates, the 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 change in standard deduction and itemized deductions, the child tax credit, and the importance of reviewing your withholding. We'll talk about how this affects uh, many of you who are landlords and those of you who are participating in the gig economy, because that's a big deal nowadays. So let's get into it. So the tax law, the new tax law is known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So if you hear that term, that's in reference to the new law, and it was HR1. So it was signed into law by the president on December 22nd of 2017. The highlights are that it reduces the corporate tax rates from a top rate of 35% to a flat 21%. It caps the interest on mortgage deductions at $750,000. And under the old law, we had seven tax brackets. And under the new law, we have seven tax brackets. So, but they're different now. Now they're 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, and the top rate is now 37% instead of 39.6%. We still have the medical expense deduction. And the limit on the deduction for state and local taxes is at $10,000. The standard deduction is, uh, is doubled and the child tax credit has been expanded. And for estate planning, for estate taxes, the estate tax exemption has been doubled. And the estate tax is slated to be repealed by 2024. So that's the highlight of the new law. So let's go into the, into the new tax brackets. So we have here the, the, the rates if you're uh, married under joint return and it's, as individual. So if you notice the top rate, you don't hit the top rate if you're married until you hit $600,000 of taxable income. If you're single, that's at $500,000. So they raised that. Before, you didn't hit the top rate until you were at $450,000. So the, the, the rates have been shifted. So many taxpayers do have a tax cut under this new tax law. So if you look at where your income might be, you can see what bracket you fit into. Now these slides are available for download, right? Okay. Yes. All right. This will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel after this. Okay. Webinar. So you can you can look at these again. You don't have to memorize these right yes. now. Yes. Uh, here are the rates for if you're a head of household filing status, and if you're a married but filing separately. So you take a look at those tables there. The, um, there's there's supposed to be some alleviation of the marriage penalty, and but it all depends on your own personal situation. Here are the rates for estates and trusts. If you notice, the top rate uh, for a trust, you hit that at $12,500 of income. Whereas if you're an individual, you don't pay that top rate until you're at $600,000. So we're just putting in here to point that out to you. And later on in this presentation, I'll explain to you why this is important. So the new rates are effective starting in 2018 and they're due to expire in 2025. So which means in 2026, if Congress doesn't make any changes, we go back to the old law, the old rates. And you probably notice you have a little bit more take home pay. The, the IRS has uh, issued new withholding tables, uh, which means our payroll service will have to update for those new uh, withholding amounts. Now, we have to be careful, we need to review the withholding and review your tax planning because you might not have to write them out withheld. So we'll talk about that a little bit later too, but it's very important that uh, you might have noticed a little more take-home pay. 
Now the kitty tax uh, was put in to um, capture people who were um, putting money in their kids' accounts. This is what rich people did. They put money in the kids' accounts and trying to have the kids pay tax at their lower rates. So Congress put in what's called the kitty tax to, to capture that. And under the old law, the kitty tax was at the parents' tax rate if they were higher than a child. So what that meant was you can't do the kids' return until you're done with the parents' tax return. And in some cases, it's an awkward conversation where you have to tell your child what your income was so they can finish their tax return. Well, under the new law, they've, they've done away with that. So if you have unearned income, it's now taxed at trust rates. It has nothing to do with the parents' tax rates. So you, the, the child can finish their tax return without waiting for the parents to finish their tax return and avoid that awkward conversation about telling the kids what your income was. So, however, if your child works, earned income is taxed at the individual single tax rates. So they still pay taxes at that rate. And then the unearned income, which would be interest, dividends, capital gains, investment income, would be at the trust rates. So the kiddie tax applies if your child's under 19 years old or your child's a full-time student under the age of 24 and they have unearned income of more than $2,100 and your child can't file a joint return. For investment planning, there's a special treatment for qualified dividends and capital gains. So the capital gains and qualified dividends can be taxed at 0%, 15%, or 20%. And under the old law, it was based on your tax bracket. So for example, if you're in a 15% bracket or lower, the tax rate on capital gains and dividends was zero. Well, under the new law, it's not based on your tax bracket, it's based upon your income. So for example, um, if you're married and your income is $77,200 or less, the tax on the capital gains and dividends are at zero. Now, if it's more than that, then it's taxed at 15% up to $479,000. So if you're married and your income's over $479,000, the capital gains are taxed at 20%. So it's still less than what the ordinary rate would be. So this kind of gives you a hint at how you should structure your investment planning. And also, if you plan on taking capital gains, this only applies for long-term capital gains, which means you have to hold the stock or security for at least 12 months. So if you're really close to that 12-month holding period, you might want to wait before you sell if you want to take advantage of the lower tax rate. So that's where tax planning comes into play. Um, also, it, it could relate to what kind of investment should I make? Should I invest in a, in a security that pays a qualified dividend such as a, a dividend-oriented stock fund, or, or do I put money to a bond fund, which is um, interest income, which is ordinary income, which would not, just have, would not just have this preferential tax rate. So it's part of your investment planning. <clears throat> okay, the biggest change in the new tax law is that the um, exemptions have been eliminated, but in a return, the standard deduction has been doubled. So if you're married filing jointly, the standard deduction is now $24,000. If you're single, it's $12,000. If you're head of household, it's $18,000. So what that means is, if you're married, your first $24,000 of income is, is tax-free. It's not taxed at all. If you're single, the first $12,000 are not taxable. So you would pay tax on any income above the $12,000 based on the tax rates. Now, if you're uh, over 65, if you're blind, you get an extra $1,300 if you're a married couple and $1,600 if you're a single individual. Under the old law, the standard deduction was $13,000. Now, uh, Congress has changed the way the inflation adjustment is calculated. It's, it would be used you be using what's called chain CPI instead of the regular CPI, which means when they change these amounts based on inflation, it's a slightly different calculation. But what, what does this mean? Well, what Congress was trying to do was to simplify our taxes. And um, earlier this year, uh, the IRS did release the new tax form. And I don't know if they were joking, but it's supposed to be filed on a postcard. But it's, it, it is, but it comes with uh, about seven pages of schedules behind it. So I'm not sure that really simplifies it. But the goal was to higher deduction of simplified tax. You have a higher 0% tax bracket. 
And what this also means is fewer uh, taxpayers are gonna be itemizing their deductions because of the higher standard deduction. So does that mean you lose your deductions? Well, what it means is you gotta do some planning with that. So if you want to itemize every year, you will need to review your itemized deductions and you might consider bunching your deductions. So a couple of examples would be your medical expenses. You might be able to bunch them. Um, if you have to get certain medical procedures done, like some dental work or whatever, you might be able to plan them so you have them all paid in one year to get a higher medical deduction. Same thing with your charitable contributions. So for example, if you're, if you're a married couple and the standard deduction is $24,000, but your $1,000 contribution to your church is not gonna uh, reduce your taxes because it's still less than the standard deduction, you might consider bunching it, which means you might make two years worth or three years worth of contributions in one year, skip a year or two, and then, and then donate again. So you might itemize in one year, take the standard deduction in another year. So it's called the bunching strategy. When it comes to, standard, uh, comes to charitable contributions, one way of, of uh, taking advantage of this bunching strategies, taking advantage of what's called donor advice funds. We'll talk about that in the next slide. And if you're over 70 and a half, you, you should consider the qualified charitable distribution. And we'll talk about that when we get to that slide. <clears throat> so donor advice funds is um, a way of getting a deduction for your contribution now. So you donate to what's called a donor advice fund and, it, and the donation stays in the fund and you can distribute to your favorite charities later. So it's kind of like having your own little foundation. So you get the immediate deduction. Um, so let's say uh, to, get to, to get to be itemizing, you might need to make $5,000 of charitable contributions. So we can put the 5,000 in this year, get the deduction, but you can give away um, your donations over time. And under the current law, there's no requirement to give it all away right now. So you have time to do that. So it's helpful for bunching your donations. And it's also best to contribute appreciated securities. Uh, for example, you have stock that went up in value or a mutual fund that's got a lot of unrealized gain or an ETF. So take a look at your portfolio and pick which assets to donate. And that's a lot better than giving cash. So you're the advisor, so that's why it's called a donor advice fund. So you make the grant recommendations and you can tell the donor advice fund to send money to your favorite charities. And the fund has different investment options and you can take a look at how to, to allocate. It could be as aggressive if you want or as conservative as you want. You can get these donor advice funds either from a commercial investment company, you can look them up, or through a community foundation. And there are many community foundations, either one locally by you or, or, or a, a specific, specific special interest community foundation, uh, such as those um, towards your own ethnic group or religion. Um, there's many of them out there. So you can look those up and find out what their minimums are, what their costs are, um, and what they can do. And some, some community foundations donor advice funds, some donor advice funds, even let you uh, donate overseas. So it's a way of getting a deduction uh, for donating to an overseas charity. If you were to donate it directly, it would not qualify for a, a tax deduction because it's not a US charity. So if that's something you're interested in, you can take a look at that. If you have further questions, you can put it in the question box. So donor advice funds. So let's talk about the qualified charitable distribution. And that's available if you're over seven and a half years old, and you can distribute up to $100,000 to your favorite charity. So that's known as a QCD, Qualified Charitable Distribution. And when you're over seven and a half, you have to take money out of your IRA anyway. That's when you're required to take a distribution. So, so it kind of kills two birds at once. So you have to take a distribution from your IRA anyway. And if you're going to get the charity, you might as well do it via the Qualified Charitable Distribution. So it's just, this is specific for IRA accounts, traditional IRA accounts, not Roth IRAs. And it doesn't affect the charitable contribution limit on your tax return, so no 60% limit. But most importantly, this is not counted as income on your tax return. So it can reduce anything that, that, that involves an adjusted gross income limitation, such as medical deductions. So that can be very helpful there. 
and also can help reduce your Medicare premiums. We have a slide, the next slide would be about the Medicare premiums. And more importantly, if you have taxable and non-taxable parts of your IRA, the, not, the taxable portion comes out first, which leaves more of the non-taxable part left. So it's a very powerful thing. Talk to your favorite charities about that. Um, they, they will help you with it. You talk to your um, IRA provider about it, and, and they can tell you what paperwork to fill out to take full advantage of it. It is now permanent in the tax law, so we have some certainty, and it's something I highly recommend. Best way to reduce your tax bill. <clears throat> this is an excerpt from the uh, Medicare brochure um, uh, on Medicare premiums. So if, um, uh, for example, if you're, if you're an individual and your income is 85000 or less, your Medicare premium is $134 a month. If you're married, it's under 70000 or less. But if your income goes above that, then the premiums go up. So here's the additions right here. So it could be, if you're high income, your, your Medicare premium could be about triple of what, what it would have been. So one way of reducing your Medicare premium is to take advantage of the QCD, the Qualified Charitable Distribution. So that's not included as income. It can reduce your, your Medicare premium. <clears throat> Salt deductions. This is the most controversial, one of the most controversial parts of the new tax law. Um, so what Congress has done is that your deduction for your state and local taxes, uh, income taxes, and real estate property taxes is limited to $10,000. Many of us pay more than $10,000, but that's the most that you can deduct. So um, that's pretty controversial. And previous years, people deducted many, many thousands of dollars. However, if you have a business and your business is paying state and local taxes, that's still fully deductible. Uh, it could be your Schedule C business, like a Schedule F business, you have a farm. If you're paying property taxes for your farm, that's fully deductible, no limit there. Or Schedule E, which is a rental property. So for rental properties, you still have the full deduction uh, for property taxes. So this is mainly uh, property taxes on your home or your second home. Now, if you work from home for your business, uh, as part of your home office deduction, you can still claim your property tax and that's not limited by the $10,000 for the portion related to your home office. And then there's questions about if I have a business, should I incorporate my business to take advantage of state, state tax deductions? And again, that, that requires an analysis to see if that makes sense or not, but that's a question worth asking. The mortgage issue deduction has changed. Under the old law, we can deduct interest on loans up to a million dollars plus $100,000 of home equity debt. That was under the old law. And this still applies for any loans that you've had before December 15th of 2017. Now, if you refinance an old loan, you can still keep the what's called grandfathered uh, rule here as long as you don't increase the balance. So, for example, if you're refinancing a loan, let's say you have a loan for uh, $900,000 and you need to refinance it. Well, the new loan has to be for $900,000 or less. You can't add to it. So for closing costs, make sure you write a check to pay for all the closing costs out of pocket. The bottom line, do not increase the balance. And our, 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 our lenders should, should be aware of this for tax planning purposes. And the last paragraph you notice is binding contract exception. And this was put in when, when, when the new law was put in place because a lot of people were in the middle of real estate transactions towards the end of the year, and, and many of them did not close until 2018. So, so, um, so basically, um, if, if you were in contract before December 15th, but you closed by April 1st of 2018, it's treated as if you uh, got the loan before December 15th. So that's the binding contract exception. <clears throat> so under the new law, if you get a new loan, if you buy a new house, um, the new limit is the deductible interest is up to $750,000 of the debt. So, and, and, and the new law also includes deductions for interest on second homes, as long as you're below the cap. So because there's discussion of eliminating deductions for second homes. However, there's no deduction for home equity debt. However, you gotta be careful about that because it, it, it doesn't matter what the bank calls the loan. 
if you use, let's say you use a home equity loan to improve your home, substantially improve your home, remodel the bathroom, the kitchen, or whatever, use it to improve the home, that will still be deductible, uh, even though the bank might call it a home equity loan. As long as you're below the limits, it's still deductible. So it doesn't matter what the bank calls it. However, if you use your loan to buy a car, pay for vacation, pay for your child's college education, that's no longer deductible. So you can be careful about that. Moving expenses are no longer deductible. So um, the only exception is if you're a member of the armed forces on active duty, if you move because of a military order, it's into a permanent change of station. So, um, so if you're being reimbursed, if your employer is reimbursing you for a move, that used to be tax-free reimbursement. Now it's taxable. So there's no deduction for moving expenses. So that's gone until 2026. Medical deductions. This is one of the retroactive changes in the tax law, um, because originally. If you're under age 65, you can only deduct medical expenses if they exceed 10% of your adjusted gross income. However, the new law draws it back to 7.5%. So for 2017, if your medical expenses exceed 7.5% of your income, it is deductible. So we still have the medical deductions. And for many of our taxpayers, it's pretty important, especially our seniors who are uh, paying for long-term care. So that's, that's, that's a big deal. And Congress is talking about eliminating it, but fortunately it stayed. Speaking of eliminating, the miscellaneous deductions have been eliminated from the tax returns. So there's no more deduction for tax preparation fees, um, no deduction for investment fees or expenses. Um, if you're an employee working for a company with unreimbursed business expenses, no longer deductible, no moving expenses, Casualty losses, unfortunately, have been severely curtailed. So if um, the only casualty losses that would be allowed is if you're in a presidentially declared uh, disaster zone, for example, the wildfires, the mudslides, and those kind of things. However, if it's your house burning down by itself, it's not going to qualify. If your car gets broken into or uh, you have a theft, um, those aren't presidentially, presidentially declared disasters, so those will no longer be deductible. The 3% P's limitation is eliminated. What that was was if your income's above a certain amount, you lost a portion of your IMIS deductions. So now that limitation is gone, whatever your IMIS deductions are, you'll get the whole thing. But you lost some of these above anyway. So what is still deductible? If you have investment interest expense, that is still deductible. So for example, that's uh, generally interest on a margin loan. So for example, let's say you have a stock portfolio of $50,000, you're allowed to borrow 50%, up to 50%. So let's say you borrow $10,000 and you use those $10,000 to buy taxable securities such as other stock funds, um, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs. That would be deductible. But if you use it to buy tax-free investments, it would not be deductible. So for example, if you use that $10,000 to buy municipal bonds, that's not gonna be deductible. If you use it to fund your retirement plan, like putting money in an IRA or a SEP, that would not be deductible. So you have to be able to trace your uh, margin loan of where it's being spent. If it's spent to buy taxable investments, we can still deduct the interest on that to the extent you have investment income. And if it exceeds that, then there's a carryover to future years. The child tax credit's been, been doubled. It's expended $2,000 for children under age 17. It was $1,000. And if your income or taxes are really low, up to $1,400 of it could be refundable. So what that means is if your, your taxes are, let's say, um, a zero, if it turns out to be zero, you'll still get $1,400 of this child tax credit. And the adjusted gross income phase-outs have been raised. So uh, you, you don't lose this credit unless your income is over $400,000 if you're a joint filer or $200,000 if you're single. Now, if your child is over 17, the credit is $500. And this also um, includes parents. So if parents are dependents, you get a $500 credit for them. Under the old law, the phase outs are pretty low. So, you know, 75,000 if you're single and 110,000 if you're married filing jointly. So it's pretty low. 
Uh, there was talk of eliminating the adoption credit. So there's still the adoption credit. So you get a credit for expenses incurred in adopting children. And the earned income tax credit is still there. That, that, that has not been eliminated. Education. During the uh, tax debate, there was a lot of discussion of making changes to the education tax credits. So there's no change to the American Opportunity Tax Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. The, um, the um, American Opportunity Tax Credit is for undergraduate uh, um, college years and the Lifetime Learning Credit is for grad school and beyond. Last year there was discussion of taxing graduate student tuition waivers that uh, is still excluded, so no tax on if you're a grad student who has your tuition waived because you're working as a, as a research assistant or as a teacher's assistant, um, there's no tax on that. The student loan deduction is still there. There's talk of eliminating that, so there's still deduction for student loan deductions. However, the tuition fees deduction of $4,000, which expired in 2016, has not been uh, revived, so we don't have that $4,000 deduction. If you're a K-12 teacher and you spend your own money for school supplies, um, you can deduct up to $500 off your tax return now. So that's been doubled. It was $250. And amazingly, this law had to be put into place. If if your student loan was forgiven, was forgiven because you either died or was disabled, is no longer is now not taxable income. We saw stories in the past where uh, parents of deceased uh, students were getting tax bills because their student loans were forgiven because their, 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 their child passed away. So, so that law is in place now that there's no tax if your um, student loans forgiven because you're either deceased or disabled. And there's talk of repealing the exclusion of interest on US savings bonds used for college. So if you have if you purchase savings bonds and use them to pay for higher education costs up to certain limits, you can that you don't have to pay tax on that interest. And there was talk of making that taxable, but uh, that didn't happen. So you still have that opportunity available to us. There's been some uh, liberalization of the ABLE accounts. Uh, ABLE accounts are, are, are for special needs children. It, it's a way of uh, putting money into an account that will grow tax-free for the benefit of that child uh, who has special needs without jeopardizing any government benefits. So the limitation on how much you can put in has been increased. And also the beneficiary can also qualify for the savers credit. It's a tax credit you get when you put money into a retirement plan. So the, the other liberalization of the ABLE account is that if there's money left over in the 529 plan, it could be rolled over into an ABLE account. So for example, a common fact pattern would be the older brother might have uh, finished college and he's got some money left over in his 529. And let's say his younger brother is a special needs child with an ABLE account, he can roll over the leftover money into that account tax-free. So, so that's, that's uh, something worth looking into. The other big change in 529 plans is now you can use up to $10,000 per year for tuition at, for K-12 uh, schools. Um, 529 plans were previously only used for higher education for college. This announcement expanded for K-12. So this gives an opportunity for parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins to, to put money into a 529 for a newborn child or, or a young child, and they can use it um, for, for expenses before college. There's been some uh, big changes in alimony. Um, so, so starting in 2019, after December 31st of 2018, any new divorce agreements, divorce or separation agreements uh, entered into starting in 2019, the alimony being paid is no longer a deduction and not income to the recipient. And so, so that, that, that will change the way um, uh, the, the settlements are negotiated and that needs to be taken into account. However, for uh, existing alimony payments um, under the old law, you can still deduct the, the deduct, the payer can still deduct it and the recipient still has to pay taxes on it. However, this gets tricky if you modify your uh, arrangement, alimony arrangement. 
And you gotta be really careful about that. So if you modify uh, your alimony from an existing agreement, and if you put an agreement that is subject to the old law, and you make reference to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, then it'll still be deductible by the payer and not taxable to the recipient. However, if you make no mention of that, if you modify uh, an agreement, it'll be assumed that it's under the new law, which means the payer won't be able to deduct the alimony and the recipient will not have to pay taxes on it. So, so we gotta be really careful when we're going into these kind of, uh, of, of discuss discussions. Retirement plans. So there's a lot of talk of, of, of making changes to retirement plans. Uh, there's been no changes to the 401ks or the uh, other retirement plans that we have available to us. So those rules still stay the same. However, uh, one big change is there's no more recharacterization of Roth conversions. So what that means is if I convert a traditional IRA into a Roth IRA, I have to pay tax on that Roth conversion. However, under the old law, I had until December, uh, October 15th of the subsequent year to undo it or recharacterize that Roth conversion and therefore not pay tax on that conversion. So for example, let's say in 2017, I did a $10,000 Roth conversion, but the market went down. That $10,000 uh, Roth IRA is now worth $8,000. So I'm still paying $10,000 on something worth eight thousand dollars so by october 15th of 2018 i can undo that conversion and then and then later i can convert it into a roth IRA again but instead of paying tax on ten thousand dollars i pay tax on eight thousand dollars well starting in 2018 under the new law if you make a roth conversion you're pretty much stuck with it you cannot undo it so if you do plan on making any roth conversions do it carefully and do it with really, really precise tax plan to make sure it makes sense for you, make sure it's the right thing to do. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a really important analysis to do. <clears throat> Backdoor Roth IRAs uh, are now allowed. Well, we didn't know if they were allowed or not. It was unclear. So now Congress and the IRS have recently told us that um, it's an acceptable to do a backdoor Roth IRA. What's, what's a backdoor Roth IRA? A backdoor Roth IRA are for people who don't qualify to contribute to a Roth IRA because their income's too high. So they contribute to a traditional IRA, a non-deductible traditional IRA, and then they convert it to a Roth IRA. So that's what's called a backdoor Roth IRA. Again, careful tax plan needs to be done to see if that's appropriate for you or not and, and see if it makes sense to do. But now there's some certainty that the IRS is not going to challenge that anymore. <clears throat> so as we speak right now uh, in Washington, there's a lot of discussions Congress has in, in, in changing retirement plans. So keep tuned on, uh, on what the changes might be. And we might do that in another webinar um, about retirement plans, because um, there's a lot of changes that could be happening with that. For state taxes, certain members of Congress wanted it repealed, but repeal didn't happen. But instead, the exemption has been doubled. So the exemption was $5 million uh, per person. Now it's $10 million. And with inflation, it's a little bit more than that. So, so what that means is uh, a married couple is really not going to pay any estate tax unless they have more than $22 million. And that number gets adjusted for inflation. So... There are very few people. It's only a few hundred people in America who pay estate taxes going forward under these new higher limits. So double check to see if you're if you have more than ten million dollars. If you're below that, there's no state tax to pay. But estate planning is still important to consider. There is talk of eliminating the step up in basis. So so that has not been limited. So we still have a step up in basis. So what that means is you inherit your house, inherit your grandmother's house and let's say grandmother paid a hundred thousand dollars for it now it's worth a million dollars with a step up in basis your cost basis is a million dollars so you only pay tax on any gain beyond a million dollars so that's what the step up in basis is um, there was talk of eliminating that but it's still there the alternative minimum tax is still with us uh, certain members of congress want to eliminate it eliminate it but for practical purposes very few people will be paying alternative minimum tax, mainly because the exemptions are now higher 
uh, it's 109,000 a year of married filing jointly. And also the biggest cause of alternative tax was the state and local tax deduction. Since that's reduced to $10,000, most people would not be paying AMT. However, <clears throat> some taxpayers might have what's called AMT credits that they've been carrying on their tax returns for the past few years, which would we'll be able to take advantage of in 2018 and going forward. Some careful tax planning needs to be done with that, but we want to make sure we don't we don't lose any of those credits. So like I said earlier, it's important to review your withholding because <clears throat> they, 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 the IRS has changed the withholding tables. So let's use this example here. We have a single person, she's making $90,000 a year and she's claiming a standard deduction. Under the old tax law, her tax was $15,654. And if she claimed single two under withholding, she would have broken even. Yeah. No big refund, no big amount too. For 2018, same income, her taxes are actually $13,105. So she has a tax cut of $2,540. And if she left her withholding a single two, she was pretty close to break even. So the good news for this example is that her withholding is fine. We don't need to make any changes. <clears throat> In our next situation here, we have a married couple. They each make $90,000, and they own a home, so they pay about $12,000 in property tax. Their state taxes are $8,300. They have a mortgage in their house, and they're paying about $20,000 of, of interest on their mortgage. With those set of facts, their 2017 taxes was $24,378. If they claim married zero, they'll pretty much break even. No tax due, no big refund. In 2018, same set of facts. Look at her taxes. It's a, it's a little bit more. It's twenty four thousand eight seventy nine. So they actually have a five hundred dollar tax increase. However, because of the new withholding tables, if they left their withholding at married zero, their withholding is now eighteen thousand two seventy six. And then they were probably pretty excited when they saw their paychecks get bigger because there's less withholding, so their their take home pay is higher. But if you do the math. Take a look at this. They're going to owe $6,603. So true, their taxes are pretty close to what last year's was, but because of the new withholding tables, they're going to come up short $6,600. <clears throat> so for them to break even, they should change your withholding to single zero. Oh, I'm sorry, single three. So if they um, fill in a W-4, check the box that they're single three, they'll tell the withholding computer to bump up the withholding so they will get closer to break even. Now you have to review your own situation to see if the withholding you have is working uh, correctly for you. <clears throat> this doesn't apply just to working people. It all applies to retired people. If you have a pension and you have withholding on your pension, double check to see if the withholding amounts are enough to cover the taxes due. The IRS website has a withholding calculator. So uh, you plug in uh, your, your, your taxable income at single three or whatever, they'll tell you what the withholding is going to be. On, the, on your state tax website, it might have a withholding calculator there. Uh, if you're taking distributions from your IRA, a lot of times that's based on a percentage. So you want to make sure those percentages are still appropriate. And you, might, you might have to raise them or lower them. You, you have to check. One thing you cannot assume is that, uh, hey, last year I got a refund. Um, so I should have refund this year. There's no guarantee that it'll be the same this year. So, so the, the takeaway is we got to review your withholding and review your estimated payments. <clears throat> so many of you might be landlords. You might have a rental property and you're collecting rent, you're paying some expenses and you have a Schedule E with some rental income. So, so what does that mean to you under the new tax law? Well, there's this new deduction called the Qualified Business Income Deduction, which is a 20% deduction that reduces your taxable income. Uh, you can take a look at our earlier podcast that we did in April on April 26th, where we go into a little more detail on the qualified business income deduction. It's very complicated, especially if you have higher income. I mean, if you're single, if your income is over 157,000 or more than 315 if you're joint, it gets a lot more complicated. <clears throat> also, with regarding real estate, one big change in the tax law is that like-kind exchanges are only limited to real estate now, also known as 1031 exchanges. So what that means is if you sell your house and do an exchange, 
if you sold your house furnished, it might come with the appliances and the furniture and all that, and that's considered to be personal property. Well, that wouldn't, you couldn't shelter that, the taxes from that in your exchange, and you'll have to pay taxes on the personal property portion of that sale. So the calculation on the tax on sale real estate, it's a little bit more complicated, but, but you need to be aware of that change. So many of us are uh, involved in gig economy. We're, we're, we're uh, driving, um, delivering food, people, running errands, whatever. But it's important for you to keep track of your expenses because you can deduct those against your taxes. Uh, the biggest expense would probably be mileage. Keep track of your mileage. It's very important to keep a calendar of where you're going so you can document your mileage. It's very important. You might be paying for supplies um, and then buy buy materials for, for the gigs you're working on, um, bags or whatever. Or um, the, 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 middle pers the middle company you're working for charges you fees. Uh, make sure you deduct those fees because the 1099 you get from them will show the gross amount. It might not deduct the fees. So make sure you're calculating the right amount of income you're paying taxes on. Uh, uh, also, this also qualifies for the qualified business income deduction. You should consider retirement plans uh, to shelter some of this income. It's also very important to, to uh, make your estimated payments. So the safe harbor for estimated payments are generally, you pay the lesser of 100% of last year's tax liability or 90% of this year, whichever is less. So you gotta run those numbers. The estimated payments are due on April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. So you gotta stay on top of that. Um, one big change in business deductions is no more entertainment expenses. So taking your client, colleague, customer, or, or potential customer to a, a baseball game, a football game, or a show, that's no longer deductible. So no more, we heard of M&E, music entertainment, no more E, E is gone. Also as part of the gig economy, Supreme Court, the California Supreme Court uh, just had a recent ruling and um, and they have this thing called the ABC test. And I'm not gonna read all these words here, you can read on your own, but, but you, you take a look at these tests to see if that person is really an employee or an independent contractor. So the big takeaway there is if I'm working for a ride hailing company and I'm providing the ride hailing services, um, would I, am I considered an employee or an independent contractor? That's a good question. However, let's say I'm a window washer, but this is a ride hailing company, just washing the windows. Well, what you do for them has nothing to do with their normal business. Most likely you'll be an independent contractor. There's some uncertainty about how the tax authorities are going to take this ruling. Um, uh, the IRS and the states have not uh, responded to this yet, so keep a close eye on this, on how this may change. So naturally, as a tax advisor, I always tell everyone to check with their tax advisor now, not at tax time, definitely do it during the year because you might need to do some mid-course adjustments, might need to make some changes in the way you're doing things and, and also be aware of what your potential tax bill might look like. So it's very important to do it now, not wait till tax time because by then the year's over, it's too late. But if you don't have a tax advisor, there are some resources you can take a look at. Uh, you can go to the IRS website, which is um, irs.gov, in the search box there, you can type in withholding calculator. They'll take you to the withholding calculator. You can check your withholding there. Type in tax reform. That's a whole section on all the changes in the tax law. The IRS will have to revise 450 forms as part of this tax law and also have to reprogram about 140 computer systems. So they have some work to do with these with these tax changes. Uh, for the landlords, um, Take a look at IRS Publication 527. It's very good. It talks about um, what you can deduct and what you need to consider as a landlord, uh, the taxation aspects of that. And if you're part of the gig economy, they actually have a section called the Sharing the Economy Tax Center, and it talks about um, all the record keeping requirements, what you can deduct, and, and things to consider as, a, as a, a gig economy worker. So we went through a lot of information today, and. Um, I think it would be a good time for uh, any questions. Yes, yeah. so okay. uh, what, let's uh, see if there's any questions. How do I get to you the can... first slide again? Oh, oh, Oops, oh. <laughs> so this is the first slide. I just need this first slide. Okay. 
Um, if anyone has any questions, you can type them in on the question section on the right hand side. It says questions and feel free to type any of them that Larry can answer. And we'll give it a few minutes. It's a lot of good information though. Thank you. Larry. Yeah. 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 Was there anything you need to be elaborate more on? No, but I learned a lot. I took <laughs> <Okay>. notes. <laughs> or any topics I didn't mention that, that should have been mentioned? No, and I'm sure we could do a follow-up on this too. So we have one question. Do you want me to uh, expand on that? Okay. So how do we contact the presenter? So do you want to give out your information, Larry, or would you want them to contact me? Um, well, I think the best thing to do is I, I do have information on my website. My website is www.larrypondcpa.com. And most importantly, take a look at the newsletters tab. And that's where um, I post late breaking news or, or good articles that come up or um, links to get some of the good videos and, and uh, things like that. Um, uh, LinkedIn is also a great way of connecting because I always post uh, articles or sometimes I see a good article and I do a like. So that's always very, very important. But, but if you, and there's also a way of contacting me through the website. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And if you do need help in any way, you can. Oh, there's another question actually. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a follow up. <laughs> My last name's Larry Pond, P O N. So again, LarryPondCPA.com is the website. Yeah, so L A R R Y P O N. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then if you do need help reaching him, you can also email me at P Y O N at BBB email.org. And I can forward it to Larry as well. Yeah. Very if, good. yeah. Of course. Are there any other questions? I think we're okay here, but but you will be having other um, skill builders um, podcasts on different topics, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So we have these once a month, and we have an email blast coming out every two weeks on the next one. So you'll hear about that soon, and we will have Larry back soon on a follow-up. On what are topics that yeah. might come up, or any big changes that are happening. Exactly. Um, and also... Uh, you can send Pearl an email on any topics you'd like to see the BBB do. Yeah, um, we exactly. Have a lot of great people who can uh, share their knowledge. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay. Oh, do you want to question? Okay, question is why does it say Kenneth Mitchell? Oh, we're just logged in as. The, oh, okay. <laughs> we're logged in as yeah. My supervisor, Kenneth Mitchell. Yeah, he's the boss. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you can send emails to him, too. <laughs> yeah, you can send it to him as well. And his email is kmitchell at bbbemail.org. Any okay. other questions? We'll give it two more minutes, and yeah. then we'll, we'll close it. And then this will be um, uh, posted on YouTube, so you can yes. always play it again, because uh, I don't know if I went too fast or not. Or, um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we have a limited amount of time. Yes, definitely. So right after this, we're going to save the recording and post it up on our YouTube page. So it's Golden Gate Better Business Bureau. And we also have a playlist on our main channel that says Skill Builder Series. So you can see all the series that we've done um, regarding this subject with Larry and others that we have done every month. Okay. Doesn't look like any other questions. Okay. Well, very good. What? Oh, Oops. we do have one. <laughs> Uh, let's see what does this say oh thank you very much great presentation very well paced well thank you much i appreciate yeah. the feedback and we're always trying to improve on doing this and um yeah we, we can talk all day if you wanted to <laughs> yeah very knowledgeable thank you okay. so much larry all right well thank, thank you and 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 we look forward to talking to you again yes thank you thank you everyone for joining and we're going to end the webinar now Bye bye